Well, today we are at uh, Hacienda Munoz, a coffee finca here right outside San Juan, about 30 minutes driving. The good thing about this place was that uh, the roads were uh, not as uh, narrow and windy as uh, some of the other places we've been. So uh, we have a tour. Let's go in. This is what it looks like. Nice parking lot. And it uh, looks like they have a little, of course they're gonna serve you some coffee here at the coffee, uh, the coffee finca. So we're here plenty of time. So let's uh, go in and just hang out. There's Lisa waiting for me. Oh good, have something to eat here? Wow, look at this set up here. Super nice. And I guess over here is the roaster. Of course they're gonna sell us some coffee here. This is gonna probably buy, buy a bag or two. from the beginning who discovered coffee and where right usually when you make a research you find three names okay and those will be German Ethiopia and Abyssinia okay Abyssinia is Ethiopia before being Ethiopia so he's telling us that uh, coffee originally from uh, Saudi Arabia and Ethiopia and migrated its way up into uh, Europe and then in uh, the 1730s or so, it was brought from France here into Puerto Rico. And so he told us that uh, Puerto Rican coffee, uh, the, uh, the harvesting and the planting really took a hit uh, between uh, you know, the beginning of the 1900s and 1950, principally because of the wars and a lot of uh, migration of uh, Puerto Ricans you know, to uh, the United States. Um, and also, uh, as, as coffee started making a comeback, uh, one of the things that happened was, um, was Maria came and wiped out 80% of the crop. And, uh, and since that time, there's been uh, you know, a couple of things, the Saharan dust, but um, you know, it's still making a comeback, and uh, right now it doesn't... Uh, uh, you know, not back to its original uh, production capability. In fact, uh, Puerto Rico doesn't even make enough, uh, really, to satisfy the needs of, uh, of internal here to the island. And if you get closer, you will notice that not everything has the same size, right? If not everything has the same size, then things get interesting in the moment of picking coffee. Our highest peak is 4,200, 500 feet over sea level. We're not that high. Other countries are producing coffee in 6,000, 8,000 feet. And still, three months ago, I saw a page of Mexican baristas doing like the best coffees in the world. Six countries and one of them was Puerto Rico. Explain to me how in one post elevation provides quality and in another post Puerto Rico is one of the best ones in the world. That doesn't make any sense, okay? In terms of shade, they like the shade, it's just that physiologically they could adjust to sun. If you provoke that adjustment, and obviously some variations could maybe handle better that situation than, than others. Okay? But not, usually they would like the, the shade, okay? But in a place like Puerto Rico, that other simple fact is helpful and you need it. Because we measure poetically 100 by 35 miles. So in, a, in terms of territory, we're really small. But in a corner, we have a rainforest with 200 inches of rain yearly. And in another corner, we have a dry forest with 30 inches of rain yearly. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're both recognized by the UNESCO as living laboratories. So they're not just any example of what they are. They're two completely different things, good examples of what they are. And they're in a place really small. 
I don't think a coffee tree will behave in the same way in every corner of the island. <laughs> so I believe that you will need to play according to the area and where you are. So Tienda Muñoz, before the storm, had 14,000 trees. And with that, I could produce between 28, 35,000 pounds of coffee. But the storm happened. So we, and the eye crossed through this area. So we still in recovery. We are around 5,000 trees. Wow. So we need to work between the things that we picked and the things that we could find locally. And not because you plant coffee, we will buy your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so you pick coffee, okay? And when you pick coffee, you need to process coffee to remove all these layers. Number two is the one that you roast, okay? So therefore, you have three principal ways to work with coffee before roasting and all this stuff. Those will be washing method, honey method, and natural process. Washing method is the common one. You pick coffee, you pulp, you clean, and then you let it dry on parchment. At sun, it will take between four and seven days, okay? Honey method, you pulp, but you don't clean. That pectin layer is a slime. You could suck that thing and it's sweet. So that's why you actually remove it. But in the honey method, you leave it. That's why it's the name, okay? It could take between two and three weeks to dry. The breeze is open. Natural process, you pick the fruit, and just like that, you let it dry. You don't take out anything, okay? It could take a month, in that case, to dry. Now, if you do a good job, it could taste fruitier, sweeter, maybe, right? If you don't do a good job, it could taste like rotten fruit and it could retain humidity. So therefore you could have funguses on your seeds, okay? Mm -hmm. That means that to add into the idea of quality, not because it's different, automatically it's better. Remember always that quality is not, is something that you need to work for it. That is not given, okay? So we will take the coffee, we'll throw it back here. This is for the washing method. If it was honey, then we need a machine that do not clean. And if it's not, I will need a machine. Okay? So we will throw coffee over here. The machine will be the one that will take it to the top and it will let it fall into water. Mature beans will descend. Beans that are not mature will keep floating. So that's the first value. Okay? Then it gets pulled, clean, and coffee will look like the one on the picture. That's coffee on parchment. Okay? the uh, thin layers surrounding the seed. We will dry coffee on parchment, and we will store the coffee when it's finished on parchment, because on parchment, coffee could last at least two years. Obviously, if you take care of it, you don't leave it in your bathroom <laughs> with sun and water, right? It could be two years. Once you peel that parchment out, it, you will need to try to roast coffee in three months, okay? So that's actually why these machines are not used every day because you use them when you need them. If I pick coffee in quantities, I will use the machine. If I need to peel coffee, I could peel 40 bags of coffee, and if I use five a week, I will, in eight weeks, I will need to turn on these machines again, okay? So it's used when you need it, okay? Now, when I need it, I will throw coffee in the pocket of that machine, okay? Over there. That machine will use a blower to send coffee to the top area, and the machine will be the one in charge of taking out that parchment, okay? The parchment will go to the back. The seeds will fall in front. So right after that, you can roast coffee in the way that you want. But if you want quality, we need to keep doing stuff, okay? So the first machine will classify by size. It will move like an earthquake, making the smaller pieces go through the holes. So coffee will be divided in different levels, and the ones that are broken or smaller because of deficiencies and defects will be out to the corner, where it says menudos down there, okay? Then coffee will go to the second machine, and that second machine will classify by weight. And you see in the table over there, it will be blowing from underneath and moving side to side. Heavier coffee will go to one side, lightest coffee will move into the other side. So we're maintaining uniformity and we're acquiring control. If we have bigger beans and smaller beans together when roasting, what will happen? Smaller beans roast faster. So coffee could look perfect and you actually could lose all the control that you had. 
just because beans are not in the same size. Mm -hmm. Okay, a lot of people stop over there, and some people don't even classify. But if you want specialty coffee, you need to do the other one, and it's the last one. That machine classifies by color. Okay, you throw coffee to the top, it goes down to some rows until there is some sensors. If the sensor identifies something that is wrong, it will send a hit of air. That thing will go to the back, and the good ones continue to fall in front. So at the end, you have a product that is clean, and it's easier to embrace the profiles of the beans on your cup. Mm. This is why I explained to you about the elevation, shade, honey, natural, municipality, country, anything that you want. Because I cannot obligate you to love the cup from Hacienda Muñoz, and that's it. You have options. And you need to identify what options are the best for you. So maybe you would choose like, if I want a coffee that tastes like chocolate, these countries in these regions can provide me that experience. So you actually narrow all your options down to some options. And maybe the difference between these last options will be the way that you're working with coffee. Okay? Uh, this is the roasting area. And free a door, I like that. And free a door. When calf is roasting, we will take samples to see physically how the bean is doing. So color will be getting darker, aromas change, size increments, and sound happens. You know that popcorn, when it's ready, it goes like... Right? Calf makes a crack. Okay? So I started to roast, time passes, first crack. After the first crack, longer time, darker roast. Thank you. <laughs> Longer time, darker rose. It will have less body, less acidity. Okay? That is a sensation of weight and texture. Acidity is a sensation over here. Okay? So when coffee is ready, you open all that coffee gets out, we stop the cooking process. Uh, things that we consider on the way, in midday, it grows faster than 8 p.m. In July, faster than in January. Okay? If the pieces are bigger, it will take longer to roast, and if humidity is higher, it will take longer too. Okay? The temperature, you decide the temperature. If it's higher, the range between being ready and burnt is smaller. So therefore, the art of roasting remains a standing over here, checking coffee constantly. Okay? When it's out, we stop the cooking process, and then we leave it rest for at least 24 hours. And we go back to what I mentioned. That time depends in the roasting and machine that you will do. In the general sense, a dark roast will be gasified faster than a lighter roast, okay? And for an espresso in coffee shops, a lot of people like to wait two weeks before using that coffee, okay? So that could give you an idea of range, okay? But if you won't do any formula, like at least like three days or something like that, and consume your coffee, okay? But that time depends <laughs> in what you will do, okay? We grind, we measure each bag, as my model over there is doing, and yeah. we seal each bag, having us assume the bags that you have in front, okay? All right. Getting a free cup of, or free shot or something. Well, that was an interesting tour of Hacienda Munoz. It's only about 35 minutes from San Juan. That sound in the background. Got the screeching peacock the in the foreground. Screeching peacock and a weed whacker or something up in the coffee fields back behind us that, that they're maintaining. But um, we learned a lot of new things about coffee here. Um, one of the most interesting to me was the history of coffee and how it really started in Africa and how it came around and was brought here by the French in, um, in the 1500s, starting in Martinique and then to the other islands. We learned a lot about the conditions that make coffee um, the favorable conditions in Puerto Rico that make it easy to grow here, um, how well Puerto Rican coffee ranks against other coffees, all the obstacles in Puerto Rico to growing coffee, including things like hurricanes and, um, and weirdly, dust storms that come over from the Sahara. Sahara yeah, and, <laughs> and certainly a manual labor shortage. That's right. But overall, it was very interesting. We got to see some really industrial strengths coffee processing equipment and uh, and then we got to learn how to taste coffee and how different parts of the tongue register different flavors like the sides will register more sour and the front will register more bitter and that was just some really interesting stuff to me 
So definitely, if you're in San Juan, it's worth a half-day trip to come on up to Hacienda Munoz and experience the coffee. Yep. So the the, cor the, uh, the tour costs uh, twenty dollars each, unless you're over sixty, then the tour costs ten bucks. Uh, and if you're thirteen and under, and also if you're thirteen under. And uh, it took our tour. We it was pretty big, about thirty-six people. It took about two hours. Usually, it doesn't take that long. Yeah. But and it wasn't that much walking. But no. Some of it was pretty steep. I'd say only a quarter or half a mile total. Yeah. Um, a lot of standing. So he tried to put you in the shade, but be prepared for that and make sure you wear a sun hat and be ready to uh, taste some coffee. So until next time, may your suitcase always be messy and don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you can see our upcoming videos. Hasta luego!